Hey devs, uh, welcome back to the channel. Uh, this video is actually just a recording of a talk that I recently, as in like just 10 minutes ago, uh, gave at 360 Andev. The talk is on uh, how to take full advantage of Kotlin for Android development. And I thought that it would be interesting and helpful for a lot of people that I know watch my channel. So I am uh, uh, re-uploading the recording here to YouTube. If you haven't had a chance, uh, go check out the 360 and Dev recordings. There's a lot of awesome talks there, a lot of talks far better than uh, my talk. Hopefully that doesn't scare you off though. And uh, I hope that you enjoy this and um, can have some takeaways for different ways that you can start using uh, Kotlin and uh, start taking a more full advantage of Kotlin in your projects. Hey everybody, thank you for uh, joining in the session today. My name is Nate Ebel. I'm a longtime Android developer, huge fan of Kotlin, and I'm super excited to be chatting with you today for 360 and Dev. This is the, the first or 360 and Dev was the first Android conference I ever attended. So it holds a special place in my heart and I'm super excited to get to be speaking at the conference for the first time. So today's talk is titled Kotlin First, Taking Full Advantage of Kotlin for Android Development. And so I wanna explore kind of different tips and tricks for all different skill levels to start taking better advantage of Kotlin as we write Android apps. So Kotlin first, a lot of us have probably heard this phrase a time or two in the past couple of years. This is Google's sort of official stance or policy as they think about building uh, Android Jetpack and different uh, framework components and things going forward. And, you know, Kotlin first is great. It's nice, but it means different things, I think, for, for lots of different people. And so I wanted to explore this idea a little bit in this talk. And I think the, the core of this, for me at least, comes down to, you know, how can we take full advantage of Kotlin kind of wherever we're at, whether we are just starting out as Android developers, whether we are kind of starting to get used to the language, or whether we're in a, you know, fully Kotlin code base already and are, you know, staying up to date with all of the new stuff coming with Kotlin. I think there's a lot of room um, at all of these levels to explore these ideas. And so that's what I started to do as I was brainstorming for this talk. I started just brainstorming different ideas or thoughts around what I could share related to, you know, taking advantage of Kotlin. So things that came up for me were, you know, migrating a Java code base over to Kotlin, you know, taking advantage of Kotlin syntax and features, looking into the Kotlin standard library, taking advantage of coroutines and flow for asynchronous programming. You know, Jetpack Compose is super exciting. There's some, you know, great talks scheduled for, for the conference this week, and I'm excited to check those out. And then uh, things like Kotlin Multiplatform and, and other kind of advanced topics. There's, there's so much here to focus in on that I had a hard time kind of, you know, picking a, a set of those. So instead, we're going to kind of focus this in on some, some different skill levels. You know, we're going to cover some things for those that are new to Kotlin and maybe are just getting started with Android and Kotlin development. You know, we'll look at some things for maybe the Kotlin practitioner, you know, someone that's been working with it for a while, but still, you know, getting a feel for how to best leverage Kotlin in their work. And uh, hopefully we'll talk about some things that are maybe more relevant to the Kotlin veterans out there as well. And so through this talk, we're going to kind of trace through this, this Kotlin journey as we go through these different levels. You know, we'll start off in the how do I start phase, you know, we'll show you how to get started writing Kotlin code for your Android apps. We'll move into the am I doing this right stage, and we'll start to explore some of, you know, the best practices some useful functions, things like that. Then we'll go to the, the I'm convinced stage, and we'll start exploring just all the different ways that we can start using Kotlin in our project. And finally, hopefully at the end, you know, we'll look at the I love Kotlin phase and we'll start exploring all the different ways that you could start leveraging your Kotlin experience, and especially uh, ways beyond Android even. So we're going to break this talk down into, like I said, get started with Kotlin, uh, some idiomatic Kotlin, going full Kotlin, and Kotlin beyond Android. 
And so in the first section, we're going to talk about, you know, just quickly, you know, how you can set up a new project, some converting Java to Kotlin, um, and how you can start experimenting with the language. Then we'll look at some, uh, some syntax highlights. We'll look at some specific uh, functions from the Kotlin standard library and how to start using those, and as well as some specific language features that are particularly useful for Android. Then we're going to look at uh, Android Jetpack more closely. We're going to look at Android KTX extension functions. Um, talk a little bit about coroutines and flow, as well as some other topics like uh, you know build scripts, uh, different libraries, etc. And finally, we'll round it out by looking uh, quickly at some topics like Kotlin multi-platform, server-side Kotlin, um, different ways that you can leverage Kotlin. So. Let's jump in uh, and start talking about these different ways of taking advantage of Kotlin for Android development. So getting started with Kotlin, how can you get started? Well, the first thing that you want to do probably is create a new Android Studio project. And uh, thankfully that has become really easy these days. So if you open up Android Studio and create uh, click start new project, the new project wizard here will default to Kotlin uh, by, by default for you. So you can pretty much uh, create any new project these days with Android Studio, and it is going to be Kotlin by default. That's all you really need to do. Now, what if you have an existing code base? Well, if you have an existing code base, you have Java code in there. As long as you're on newer versions of the, the Gradle plugin, you should be able to convert that existing Java to Kotlin. You can go to the, the code toolbar, and select convert Java to Kotlin. Additionally, you can use the uh, the action lookup shortcut and uh, select convert Java to Kotlin as well, and it'll automatically convert any of that existing Java code over for you. Now, additionally, if you find some useful Java on the web, maybe on Stack Overflow or Android documentation, you can paste that Java into an existing Kotlin file and it'll automatically convert into Kotlin for you. So that is a, a super useful trick that I know a lot of uh, sort of beginner developers aren't necessarily aware of, but it's very helpful. Now, there's, uh, there's a few ways right within Android Studio that we can uh, start to play with the language and kind of evaluate it and uh, toy around with syntax and such. So the first of that is Kotlin scratch files. Then we have the, the Kotlin REPL tool. And then additionally, we can add a main function to pretty much any Kotlin file and then run that function and evaluate any of the code in it. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, idiomatic Kotlin. We'll just give some you know, quick tips and tricks for you know, moving in that next step of the Kotlin journey. So Kotlin has a lot of useful syntax features and it's hard to kind of be aware of everything and, and it's definitely hard to know whether or not you are taking advantage of the syntax. So a few uh, tips for you. If you're just starting out, you're starting to get a feel for, for Kotlin syntax. You know, take advantage of non-null types. That's one of the biggest advantages of Kotlin is that we have this differentiation between null and non-null types. So whenever you can, try to uh, make things non-null that you expect to be non-null. And in the barriers between Java and Kotlin, that's where you can then make those choices of how are we actually going to handle null, which is something that sometimes slips through the crack when we're working in a purely Java code base. You know, and along those lines of handling null, don't just add the double bang operator everywhere. Um, that often pops up when you're converting Java to Kotlin, and it's typically a code smell. Uh, this is going to crash your code at any call site where you use this and an object is null. And that usually means that you have some hole in your logic and you probably want to handle this in some other way besides just crashing. Um, another interesting example of Kotlin syntax for Android is that we want to take advantage of non-null types. However, there's a lot of things like inflating views that we can't do until certain lifecycle methods have happened. So instead of creating a property for, let's say, a text view and defining it non-null to begin with, uh, we have to wait until onCreate is called. So to do that, we can take advantage of late init variables. Late init keyword signifies to the compiler that this will be non-null eventually. And so we can delay the initialization of this until onCreate has been called. And that way we get to take advantage of the non-null type and we can still work nicely with the Android lifecycle. Now, another uh, great thing about Kotlin 
is that uh, it has first class support for functions. And one of the big ways in which this comes through for Android is that we can have, you know, utility functions and helper functions without enclosing classes. So this is really big. Uh, we're going to see some examples of this later on. Um, but as you're going forward, if you start to think about how you're structuring your code, ask yourself whether you actually need a class or not, or maybe you can simply have a Kotlin file somewhere and group related functions in that file. Now the Kotlin standard library is for me is one of the, the biggest draws for Kotlin. I think it makes programming it really fun, really efficient, um, cuts down on boilerplate. So I want to talk about some of the ways in which the Kotlin standard library can help us and show some specific examples that I find really useful. So first off, we have uh, these little helper methods for creating collections. So we have array of, list of, map of, all of these will create uh, immutable uh, collections. Um, and then similarly, we have, you know, mutable list of, immutable map of, if you need a mutable type. Uh, we have filter functions for all of these collections. So we can, you know, filter out items for these. This is really helpful if we're doing, you know, selection or, you know, trying to cut down on the items we're showing on screen, maybe. You know, we have map functions if we want to, you know, convert uh, items from one type into another type. You know, this is uh, something, you know, filter and map that became really popular with uh, RxJava. Now we get these uh, in Android without necessarily needing to pull in RxJava simply by using the Kotlin standard library. Uh, or empty is actually a really nice function that I find myself using a lot. Essentially, in certain cases where maybe a filtering operation or a take or something like that could possibly return a, a null or, or just nothing, you can add this or empty to there to sort of signify that we expect to never have a null return type. And it's kind of nice because it forces you to think about that null um, and you can handle it more gracefully. Get or else is another fun example of this. You know, let's say you want to grab, you know, you do a bunch of filtering and you want to take, let's say, the first element of the list or maybe the last element of the list or some sort of default value if that's not present. Um, or maybe you just want to grab some random element out of a list, but you don't know necessarily if it is within the bounds of that list, uh, you can provide a default value so that you always have some type of reasonable fallback. And then uh, there's a lot of useful string uh, methods as well. So a couple examples here that I find myself using all the time. Uh, you could check, you know, is a string null or empty? Is the string null or blank? Um, those are really helpful, again, if you're thinking about error cases around strings. You know, you want to check if it's null, if it's empty, if it's blank. And thankfully, this happens out of the box for us. So here's an example of us creating a, an Im immutable list here of just some, some strings. We got a null value in there as well. And we're assigning this to a variable called awesome things. Now, let's say we want to filter out all the null values. Well, this is really easy. We have this filter not null function that does that for us. Now maybe we want to filter out any strings that are less characters than, than six. So in this case, that might filter out the, the Kotlin string. Now let's say that instead of returning this filtered list, uh, that we want to actually get a specific element. So in this case, I'll use the get or else function to grab the first uh, item out of this filtered list or return this default string here saying, you know, that there, there were no elements matching our criteria. So now at this point, we would be returning uh, 360 and dev as the only string from this uh, operation. And now, now maybe we want to um, map this into some different type. So we could use the let function here then to convert this from a string type into this awesome thing type. Um, so this is just a, an example of how you can chain these different functions together and you get this very uh, easy to follow, um, expressive and concise block of code that is really doing a lot of work here. We're doing some you know, filtering for different error cases, we're doing mapping, error handling, um, and it's, it's really powerful. And so as you think about writing your code, think about the way you can leverage these types of standard library functions. Explore the standard library. There's a lot of great stuff in there. Now there's a, a lot of great special language features with Kotlin, but in particular, a few that I find particularly useful for Android development 
include data classes, sealed classes, and extension functions. So what is a data class? A data class is um, ideally a, a simple value holder. Essentially, defining something as a data class, uh, the compiler will generate um, equals and hash code and, and two string methods for you. And so it makes it really great if you want to have some type of immutable object that you can compare to other uh, objects of the same type, check whether the value is the same, objects are the same. So here's an example of a data class to represent a repo. Maybe you are loading repository data from the GitHub API. So in this case, we have three immutable properties, name, owner, and stars. And uh, we could then use this later maybe to show in a recycler view, or maybe we're comparing. And because it's a data class, we could compare two instances of repo together um, and, and rely on the fact that that equals and hash code implementation is going to be done properly for us without having to write all that boilerplate. So uh, that's something I find really helpful, particularly when modeling data. Now, another uh, tool for modeling data are sealed classes. And sealed classes represent kind of restricted class hierarchies. And a place where I find this particularly helpful is kind of modeling view state or maybe view events when I'm working in an MVVM architecture. So here we have a, a view state sealed class. And so all uh, sort of child classes in this uh, sealed class have to be defined within the same file here or within this same enclosing block. So here, the only three types of view state that can exist are loading, error, and success. So this makes it really easy for us to make sure that we handle all the different uh, cases of view state in say maybe our activity or fragment where we're getting a view state from a view model. Within the implementation of each individual view state child, we can use different class types. So we might define an object uh, class here um, since the loading state could maybe be a singleton and doesn't have any state associated with it. Um, and we can use data classes as we are defining our sealed class as well. So here we have an error and success data classes, each take a single property. So we could compare one success to another and maybe have more efficient diffing as we're updating our UI. And then the last one here, uh, extension functions. Extension functions let us sort of add functionality to e existing types. So here's an example. We could create an extension function called long toast um, on the context type. So instead of having to every time call toast, I'll make text, pass in a context, then the message and long, uh, we could create this sort of helper function here called long toast. And we could invoke this by simply uh, calling long toast on a context and passing in the message. So this is one way in which we can think about restructuring our kind of helper methods or helper classes to take advantage of Kotlin functions as opposed to always having to have some type of enclosing class. This is really great for sort of massaging APIs that you don't control and making them fit sort of your workflow a little bit better. So now let's look at uh, how to go full Kotlin here, how to start embracing Kotlin in more ways in your code base. So the first thing just want to mention here, I think, is, is Android Jetpack, because this is really where all this Kotlin first sort of mindset started to really permeate. Um, and we're kind of seeing that today. You know, we have recently sort of big updates, uh, paging library version three, which is written from uh, entirely in Kotlin. So that's a big deal. We're now seeing some of these Jetpack libraries written from scratch with Kotlin in mind and taking advantage of all the Kotlin features. Uh, I believe the, the uh, benchmark library as well is also written all in Kotlin, even if it doesn't necessarily ship with your app. It's still a big deal that even, you know, some of these tooling libraries are written in Kotlin. Um, and then sort of across the board for all of these Jetpack libraries, we have Android KTX, which is a set of extension functions and um, properties and uh, just sort of wrapper APIs that makes working with Android Jetpack much nicer uh, when you're using Kotlin. Um, and, and honestly, I feel like this is something that I always forget about or, or just don't check enough because these, are, these uh, functions and APIs and everything are being updated constantly, and there's lots of useful functionality in there. So I want to talk a little bit more about Android KTX. 
So like I said, specifically, this is a set of you know extensions for, for the Jetpack libraries. Um, and they let us leverage Kotlin features like you know extension functions and properties, lambdas, um, and especially coroutines lately as a lot of the, the libraries are being updated. So here's an example of something coming out of KTX. Um, this is part of the KTX core package. Um, and this kind of shows you the type of thing that you know Android KTX aims to do. Here we have this sort of a wrapper around shared preferences that makes uh, editing shared preferences a little bit more fluent. Instead of having all this extra boilerplate and getting a you know an, a, sort of a, like an edit class and then calling uh, you know put string and everything on though and explicitly calling commit and all that, we get shared preferences. We call edit. We pass a lambda. And then we can kind of very fluently call, you know, put string, put boolean, put all of our data in there, and then we don't have to remember to call commit or apply. Similarly, we have a fragment KTX package. So here's, you know, a similar pattern where we get a fragment manager. We call commit with a lambda, and then we can configure that fragment transaction within the lambda, and then it sort of takes care of actually putting all those pieces together and making sure it's all called correctly. So again, it's a little bit more fluent and is very Kotlin idiomatic with the use of you know, functions and lambdas. So here's a, a live data example. So we could create a live data using this live data helper function that makes it very easy. We call the live data function, pass a lambda, and within that lambda, we can configure the initial value for that live data. Similarly, we have KTX uh, functionality for room. So here's one that I'm particularly interested in where we're using room KTX to add a coroutine and flow support to room. So here in the first method there, get repos, we are defining this as a suspending function that returns a list of repos. Uh, in the sec second example there, we have a get repos that returns a flow of list of repo. And so this support for suspending functions and flows are both coming out of this room KTX uh, package. And now another one here, uh, kind of related to coroutines, we have view model KTX. And so with view model KTX comes a view model scope, which makes it extremely easy to start using uh, anything coroutines based from within a view model. So let's uh, let's talk more about coroutines then, as we're seeing they keep coming up within you know Jetpack and and KTX. So what is the big deal around Kotlin coroutines? Well, uh, as of very recently, coroutines are the recommended solution for async programming on Android. So we can uh, maybe think about moving away from the async tasks, maybe moving away from thinking about Rx Java as being this uh, sort of um, asynchronous programming primitive for us. Um, and now if we really just want to make sure that we are having performant code off of the main thread, coroutines are our default way of going about that. So here's a simple example of using coroutines. So we have the suspend keyword here on this uh, show tasks function, indicating that this is going to be a suspending function and uh, should be executed from within a coroutine scope. So within that, we can then run you know, long running tasks as we need it. So maybe load tasks from disk is slow because we're loading up a bunch of files or whatnot. We can run that long running task and then call that display tasks method to update the UI. And we can be sure that we're not going to be blocking the UI. Because this is a coroutine, it's going to do all of the heavy lifting in the background without blocking the thread it was called from. Then it's going to come back and we can update the display tasks. So we can start thinking about using these then very easily within our, our view model, for example, because of this view model scope. It provides us you know, the scope we need to start calling uh, these suspending functions or to start collecting on a flow. And we can start using uh, suspending functions, you know, like I said, from, from room, we can permeate that into maybe our repository layer. Um, here's an example of our, our network layer. Many of us use retrofit. And so we can now define uh, suspending functions with retrofit. And then we could then call that from within our coroutine scope as well. So here I am calling that load task for user suspending function within uh, you know, my, my view model scope here. And then we could you know, update the UI, 
Uh, we could save the response, do whatever else we need to, but we could be confident that we're not blocking. So coroutines are really starting to become very simple to use as you know, common libraries like uh, Room and Retrofit are supporting them. You know, our, our view models, our activities, our fragments, they support them with the, the life cycle um, scopes. So it makes it really easy to get started. Now I mentioned Kotlin Flow a couple times. Kotlin Flow is a, an async data stream leveraging coroutines. You can think of this very similarly to sort of Rx Java, but it's all coroutines based. So for example here, maybe from a room you might have used a flowable in the past. Well, these days we could use flow from the, the coroutines package, and it operates in, the, in very similar ways. So here's another example. We could get a, a flow from our database, and then we could convert that into a live data using the as live data extension function. Um, and so we could convert that flow into a live data as we might have done before with, let's say, you know, Rx Java uh, observables and converting those into a live data. Similarly, we could actually think about replacing live data altogether. Uh, the recently sort of developed uh, state flow, immutable state flow, allows us to sort of replicate that same live data behavior, but all in this coroutines based flow API. Um, so in this case, we have a very uh, similar pattern to a lot of the live data examples where we have sort of this private mutable state flow. We give it an initial state, um, and then we expose that view state as a state flow. And so then we could collect that within a um, coroutine scope, let's say in our fragment or our activity, and then we could handle that the same way we would, you know, an observable stream or something. We could you know, perform operations on it. We can, you know, use it to update our I, I, uh, our UI. Um, it really becomes a nice way to sort of start using coroutines throughout the different layers of our application. Uh, so another interesting way in which you could start leveraging Kotlin for your projects is using the Gradle Kotlin DSL. I know a lot of people uh, seem to not enjoy working with Groovy for their build files. Um, and so this could be a way to sort of get around that. You can create a build.gradle.kts file and define your build configuration for Gradle using TypeSafe Kotlin. So in this example here, it looks very, very similar to the Groovy version, but you do have sort of better uh, type safety and you know command lookup and everything there that comes along with having a real you know statically typed language. Um, now, just as a caveat, the support for this still isn't you know a hundred percent there, uh, but it definitely works and it's definitely worth checking out if you have ever been frustrated with Groovy for your Gradle scripts. So Jetpack Compose, it definitely couldn't leave this off. Um, this is gonna just be a real quick overview of Compose and I encourage you to check out some of the other really interesting sounding Compose talks uh, this week. Um, you know, Compose is the future of UI development for Android. There's no doubt about that. Everybody's super excited about it uh, and rightfully so. Um, but as we move to Compose, it's gonna make it even more valuable to start taking advantage of Kotlin in your projects. Um, so this is just sort of the hello world of compose, um, basically you write a Kotlin function and you annotate it with the at composable annotation. Um, and that sort of signifies to the, um, the kind of the compose uh, compiler plugin and figures out how to get that onto the screen for us. So if we look at a slightly more complicated example, here we have a composable that uh, creates a, a column and it puts two text elements into that column. Um, and so this is how Compose really works. You have these different functions. You have this nice DSL. that's all taking advantage of all the Kotlin features to provide this very nice declarative way for us to build UI for Android. Um, and then here we could, you know, call one of those uh, composables within our set content method in the activity. And that's it. We have no XML, but we have a nice uh, UI all written in Kotlin. So just as a few bonus things here, there's a lot of other helpful libraries out there these days, all taking advantage of Kotlin. So we have Coin for dependency injection, uh, SQL Delight for um, SQL databases, 
uh, Mashi for JSON deserialization, Coil for image loading, Mach K for testing. All of these are designed to really take strong advantage of Kotlin. And if you're in a Kotlin heavy code base or a Kotlin only code base, these are all really interesting options for you. And I encourage you to check them all out. So now we'll think about going into our last section here, uh, Kotlin beyond Android. You know, what else can you do with Kotlin? Well, Kotlin multi-platform is the first thing that comes to mind for me. I think Kotlin multi-platform is a really exciting proposition for a lot of people out there. Um, so Kotlin multi-platform lets us share core logic across platform. So it's a cross-platform solution in a sense, but it's different because you're not sharing a native UI. So Kotlin multi-platform lets us write common code in Kotlin. We think of this as like the core business logic. Um, we can then package and consume that core logic for multiple targets. And those targets include things like, you know, Android and JVM. Um, for Android and JVM, it's essentially just, you know, native code. There's no integration pans, works super well. Um, you could build um, Kotlin multi-platform and consume a framework for iOS or Mac OS or, or watch OS, any of the, the Apple platforms there. Um, similarly, you can target uh, JavaScript or, or other native, you know, platforms, you know, Linux, et cetera. Now, like I said, Kotlin multi-platform does not replace native UI. So it's not a direct comparison to something like a Flutter or a React native. Um, but because of that, it's also relatively low risk, especially for Android, because you really are just sort of creating like this library module or this library framework. So if for some reason it didn't fit your needs, it's much easier to swap it out again for something else, as opposed to something like a Flutter or React Native that's really an all or nothing solution in a lot of cases. Now, another great place to start leveraging Kotlin is uh, for server-side development. So uh, there's a number of useful uh, frameworks out there that have great support for Kotlin for server-side development. Uh, Ktor, in particular, um, developed by JetBrains, makes setting up a simple server with uh, Kotlin really easy. Uh, Spring Boot has great Kotlin support as well. Um, and then some other ones out there as well. Uh, Quarkus is another one that came up as I've talked to people about Kotlin on the server side. Um, so here's just a simple example of uh, a Ktor service. This is basically the, the hello world here, where you have a, a main function written in Kotlin, and then uh, basically you end up with this routing block here and we have this nice DSL for defining our endpoints, you know, so we're adding a couple gets here, one at a root level, one for a slash tasks endpoint um, and configuring all of this becomes really easy with the DSL. So authentication, it becomes straightforward. You know, we have different ways of defining the, the routes and to organize the code. We can take advantage of things like extension functions to make all of that even easier. Um, so if you have any type of interest in playing with some simple server-side development, um, Ktor is a really fun place to start. I've had a lot of enjoyment out of that. So more, more Kotlin, just kind of wrapping it up here with a few other areas that you could think of, um, of applying your Kotlin knowledge. So uh, like I said, JavaScript, um, you know, the support for here is, is still coming along. You know, it's not you know, 100% there in all areas, but it is possible to uh, write Kotlin that targets JavaScript and use it to build something like a React application, which is, which is pretty fun. Um, like I said, Kotlin native, you know, using Kotlin to build for, you know, native development platforms like Linux, that's coming along there. There's some big changes coming recently to um, like the memory model um, and, you know, support for, for coroutines or multi-threaded coroutines and whatnot. So a lot of things that are happening there. JetBrains is putting a lot of investment into this. Um, so I do believe that will continue to be a developing story. Um, and then the last one that's interesting uh, is Kotlin scripting using a K script. Oop, a typo on my slide there. Uh, anyways, uh, we can uh, write scripts, you know, similarly like you would think of writing a shell script. You can do that using uh, Kotlin. Um, that's a, it's pretty interesting way. There's some interesting blog posts of ways people have used that out there. But again, and just another way to sort of leverage your knowledge of Kotlin to improve your efficiency as a developer. So Kotlin first, uh, you know, we know that, you know, from the Google team for Jetpack, that means, you know, more libraries using Kotlin, taking advantage of it. But I think from a, from just a larger ecosystem standpoint, you know, there's a lot of 
places for us to think about Kotlin first, you know, learning the language, we can start to develop, you know, our server side code, our, our Android code, uh, build common code for multiple platforms. Uh, it's gotten easy to start a project in Kotlin these days. The tutorials and documentation are all trending towards being all in Kotlin. Um, Kotlin really is sort of the first choice for writing modern Android applications. So, you know, in closing here, you know, we looked at uh, setting up a project, some samples, uh, all that's defaulting to Kotlin these days. You know, libraries and tooling are getting really strong support for Kotlin. Lots of great third-party libraries out there with Kotlin support. Um, you know, coming from Google, we have recommendations like coroutines for asynchronous programming. Uh, we're adding support for, for Flow. We have all of the KTX extensions, all of this aimed at making Kotlin super useful for Android developers. And then, like we said, you know, Kotlin is certainly useful beyond Android and is continuing to just be more and more so. So hopefully as you're moving along through this Kotlin journey, you have found, you know, some, some tips, some tricks, some things to consider to help make yourself a little bit more productive, to take more full advantage of Kotlin for Android development. And with that, uh, I will close it all out. If you um, would like to reach out to me or chat about Kotlin or anything, feel free. Uh, all of my info uh, right here, um, getting a hold of me on Twitter is probably the best way. Um, and I will be you know, in the chat for some of the other sessions for the conference this week. Um, and I hope to uh, talk to you all soon. Enjoy uh, 360 and